let me first thank uh, Brother Daniel and the congregation here at the Unitarian Church for inviting me here to speak to you today. I'm truly humbled and honored to be given this opportunity to be here to fellowship with you. I've been at a lot of different places of worship, faiths, different faiths and places of worship, and I've never felt more welcomed and, and, and comfortable than I do right now. And a lot of the scriptures that you read, I said, well, that's Islam. <laughs> <laughs> so the difference between you and us, as the Nigerian the Abyssinian once said, is as thin as this line. It's not a big difference. And I've been told I got 20 minutes, <laughs> which is hard for me. But I'm going to try to get it in no matter how long it takes. <laughs> so dear people, I greet you with the, 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 the best greeting that one person can give to another person if it's sincere, the greeting that was taught to our father, and I say our father, all of our father, Adam, by the angels, and the greeting that our prophet Muhammad, the prayers and peace be upon him, has said, you will not, he said, by him whose hand is my life, you will not enter paradise unless you believe, and you will not truly believe unless you love one another. He said, so I teach you something that will help you to love one another. He said, spread the greeting of peace. So I say to you with love in my heart for all those who are present here today, Assalam alaikum, which means peace be unto you. And I must thank Allah for allowing me to wake up this morning. That's not a given. Five million people went to bed last night and didn't get up. So the fact that he's allowed us to get up and be here today is nothing short than a mercy from God, and we must thank him for it. I always thank him for it. And I thank him for his many attributes and names. Some scholars in Islam say that that Allah has uh, 3,000 names, that 1,000 of them were revealed to the angels, that 1,000 of them were revealed to the different prophets that he sent. 300 are mentioned in the, the Torah of Musa, alayhi salam. 300 are mentioned in the Zubor or the Psalms of Daud, David, alayhi salam. 300 are mentioned in the Injil or the Bible of Isa, Jesus, alayhi salam. 99 are mentioned in the Quran of Muhammad, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi salam. And one name alone, God said, is he's kept the knowledge to to himself. That being said, the attribute which I hold dear to my heart is El Musawir. It means the fashioner. And I thank him for fashioning me as an African American. And I think we all should thank God for fashioning us whatever way he's fashioned us. And for him being my Rab. The translation in Arabic for Rab is Lord, but Rab has many meanings. It means protector, guardian, evolver, uh, giver of, of, uh, uh, of, of shapes and colors, and one that never leaves you and causes you to grow and change. And I thank him for evolving me from an African-American into now an African-American Muslim, a descendant of kings and queens from Africa who brought, who brought their faith with them on those slave ships never giving it up, but who were once here thought to be of less than a human being, thought to be of no value at all, but now being called on to help remake the world. I thank him for allowing me to be free in my thinking. I'm not trying to imitate anyone ethnically or culturally, but rather trying to emulate the best pattern of conduct the world has seen, that being the Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and peace be upon him. And I thank God for the spirit he has given me. He's given me a spirit of compassion, acceptance and unity of purpose for all good people of faith taught to me by my first teachers, my parents, Luther and Nancy Jennings, and nurtured by the vision and the leadership of the, the man that I chose to look to for leadership, that being the late Imam W.D. Muhammad. In my kutbah or sermon, I'm going to go a little off script, but not really, and I pray uh, that I will bring my point full circle. I have a tradition during the, the month of February, which may not, uh, may, which you all may or may not know, is Black History Month. I was telling them earlier, you know, they chose February as Black History Month. It's the shortest month of the year. <laughs> but they didn't do that for that reason. It was chosen because it is the month in which Carter G. Woodson, who was the founder of Black History Month, was his birthday and is also the birthday of the great orator, 
Frederick Douglass, those two men, that's why they chose February, so I, I don't feel some kind of way no more. <laughs> but I'd like to highlight <clears throat> during this month men and women of color in Islam who have made a contribution to humanity, men and women like uh, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Noble Drew Ali, Mansa Musa. Many people don't know that Mansa Musa was the richest man to ever live on the earth. He was a Muslim. He was a black man from Africa. People like Betty Shabazz and Aisha Mustafa. These are my contemporaries. Or I'd like to talk about Muslims I know personally who have made a difference in our world. Like Sister Fatima Ali, who's sitting right down front here. And Brother Richard Hassan, one of our pioneers who helped build many masjids and was a friend of Malcolm X and hang, hung around with Malcolm a lot. That's the community I come from. Or people like Yahya Shakir, my great and dear friend who, who's passed on, but who made Hodge 13 times and took people in Hodge those many times. People like Sylvester Johnson, the first black commissioner, in the, a Muslim commissioner in the city of Philadelphia. He's a Muslim, a member of our congregation. But today I'd like to tell you about one of the Sahaba. Sahaba means companions. One of the companions of the prophet, Muhammad the prayers and peace be upon him, who without doubt was the most famous and revered Muslim of color in Islamic history. And he is considered for a lot to be that way for a lot of reasons. Because he speaks to the mission of the prophet, who was called Rahmatul Anas. Muhammad was called Rahmatul Anas. He was a mercy to all humanity, not just the Muslims. He's for the whole world. And because he speaks to the appeal Islam has had in the African American community, and its appeal to the marginalized, the poor, and the young. And other companions, Islam has produced great Muslims of color. People like Baraka, the lady Baraka, whom they called Umayman. Baraka was referred to the Prophet as my mother after my mother. She was with the Prophet from the time he was born to the time he died. She has the, only, she has the distinction of being the only Sahaba that can make that claim. And she was a a great woman. She would walk miles and miles in the desert to bring secrets that the Quraysh were harboring against the Muslims back to the Prophet and, and let them know what was going on in Mecca, in the desert, with no shoes on, feet cracking and burning. And when she'd get back, the Prophet of the land would tell her, Mom, sit down, and he would massage her feet. This black woman who had great character, who the prophet once said, if you want to marry a woman from the paradise, you do good to marry Baraka. Great woman, great black woman. Or well, Muhammad Ibn Muslimah, the seven foot black giant, big giant of a man who had a sword just as big as him given to him by the prophet, who was the prophet's personal bodyguard. But when fighting broke out between the Muslims, that sword that he cherished and talked about and held so dear, he broke it and vowed never to have a sword to fight against other Muslims. Or Usama ibn Zaid. Usama ibn Zaid was the grandson of the Prophet. And when the Prophet would make prayer, Usama ibn Zaid could be seen climbing along the Prophet's back and they would say, no, you can't do that. And he said, leave him alone. That's my grandson. Let him do what he want to do. He was a black little boy. And the son of Zayd ibn Harif, who was the adopted son of the prophet, so therefore he was the prophet's grandson. They were all great Muslims of color, but most Muslims don't even know their name or their stories. But if you ask 100 Muslims, 99 of them will know who Bilal is. Bilal ibn Rabah. Whenever praise was heaped on his deserving shoulders would lower his eyes, filled with tears flowing down his cheeks to say, indeed I am an Abyssinian. Yesterday I was but a slave. Who was this black slave 
And what was it about him and his life that spoke to the mission of Muhammad the prophet? The prayers and peace be upon him. Bilal was an Abyssinian. Abyssinia is what we now call Ethiopia. He was a slave under the ownership of Umayyad ibn Khalif, who was one of the leaders of the Quraysh tribe and one of the most ruthless and evil spirited opponents of Islam. So when news reached Umayyad that this property of his, this black slave, had accepted the, the, this new religion, he was furious. He was outraged. So he decided, I'm going to break Bilal. I'm going to break his spirit, and I'll make him recant this, this new religion. How dare he? He's my property. So one of the torture methods used that he used to try to break Bilal was he would, he would strip Bilal down naked. And he would tie him down in the sun, in the burning hot sun of Mecca. And if anybody here has ever been to Mecca, and I know there's some people here that have been, you know Mecca's 120 in the shade. So he would wait till the noon sun was overhead, 130, 140 degrees, strip this man naked, tie him down into the sun. And he would say, recant, recant your faith. And Blau would just look up at him and say, ahead, ahead, ahead. So he said, I'll get him, I'll get him, I know what I'll do. So he had a suit of metal made for Bilal. And he put the suit of metal on Bilal, and then he tied him back down in the sun with the suit of metal on him, in the hot burning sun. And he said, recant your God, give up your faith. Say, our Latin, our Uzo, your gods, the gods of our fathers. Forget this Allah. And he would stare up at him and say, ahead, ahead, ahead. So he took this metal off him and he put him back in the sun, in the burning sun, naked, and he took a boulder and put it on his chest to restrict his breathing so he couldn't breathe no more. He said, I got him now. We can't, Bilal. We can't. And Bilal said to him, I can't speak these words that you ask of me. I can only say to you this, ahead, ahead, ahead. So we might have had the, the young boys of Mecca take Bilal out, strip him, put a, 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 a rope around his neck and, and march him around Mecca nude like a dog trying to embarrass him, bring him back home and say, this is going to happen to you every day until you recant your faith. And Bilal will say, ahead, ahead, ahead. So Yumai was just about at his wit's end. He couldn't take it no more. He was tired. As he finally he was convinced that he, he couldn't break Bilal, Bilal's stubbornness. And he resolved himself to the, the fact that Bilal would have to be killed. He would have to be killed to make an example for the others who might want to uh, follow this new faith after him. But unbeknownst to him, word of Bilal's torture and hardship had gotten back to Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, may God be pleased with him, a wealthy and kind-hearted soul who too had accepted this new faith. So he went to Umayyah and he offered to buy Bilal from him which was to Umayyad's liking because, you know, he saw no more value in this man. He, he was getting ready to kill him anyway. So he said, yeah, sure. So upon sealing the deal, Umayyad sought to humiliate and embarrass Bilal by telling this to Abu Bakr. He said, by Azut or by Uzzah, Abu Bakr, you've been bested. I bested you. And Abu Bakr said, what do you mean you bested me? He said, if you, if you had refused to buy this worthless slave for even one ounce of gold, I would have sold him to you. And Abu Bakr promptly replied, by Allah, if you had 
asked for 100 ounces of gold, I would have paid you for him. It's pretty loud. Now he was the possession of Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr instantly freed him. Bilal went beyond all expectations from his lowly and humble beginnings to become one of the greatest men in the history of Islam because he possessed great faith. He adopted an attitude that would not only honor Islam but also honor all of humanity. The mission and the message of Muhammad the Prophet, the prayers and peace be him, taught to Bilal and to a billion more. The message that transformed Bilal and to a teacher to all humanity in the art of respecting conscience and defending freedom. The same message that allows an African-American Muslim man to love and marry a Baha'i woman, even as Baha'is are being persecuted in Muslim countries around the world. The same message which brave thinkers like Aris, Ophelius espoused, and the same message that Servetus gave his life for the message that Lindsay and Priestley taught and that the Sozinists delivered in Poland and that Frené David established in Hungary where for the first time in history of Christianity, the ruling body practiced tolerance of opinion in matters of faith. Up until that time, they didn't do it. It is the message of Bilal and all those before and after him. The message of Ahad, oneness. Ahad, one God. Ahad, one humanity. Ahad, one human family. We're one human family. If you were to translate that Arabic word into English, you might get the word uni, meaning one, like unicycle, uniform, unison, universe, unitarian, unity. This was the mission of Muhammad. This was the mission of Muhammad the Prophet, the prayers and peace be on him then. And this is the mission of the Muslims, the, the sober-minded thinking Muslims today. Muhammad the Prophet, the prayers and peace be upon him, once said, one day you will see me and Jesus together. Look around the room today, dear brothers and sisters. Muhammad and Jesus are together today. This is, this is the prophecy being fulfilled. Earlier in the, in the earlier faith uh, reflection that we had, one of the sisters said, when, we were, when, when they were asked about, you know, what's on your mind, she was saddened. She thought we were losing this war on peace that, we, that we're fighting and on unity that we're fighting. And in my mind, I had to, I had to disagree with her in my mind because God in the Quran says, sometimes you think a thing is good for you and it's bad for you. And sometimes you think a thing is bad for you and it's good for you. With all this Islamic phobia, with all this, this things going on around the world, our Imam W. D. Muhammad told us we are living in the day of deen. We are living in the day of religion. We're living in the day of God. People are asking questions about Islam now that they, they weren't asking before. This dialogue being started. More Muslims, more people accepted Islam after 9-11 than any other time in the history of Islam. So God is in control of everything. And he says not a leaf falls off a tree without his permission. So we might look at it and we think things are bad. Know that things aren't bad. Things are great. Things are great because people of faith are coming together. We have to. This is why I'm so humbled to be here today. I'm so grateful that the believers from my community and our masjid have come here to be with you believers of faith there.
I'll end with this revelation given to Muhammad the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just means the prayers and peace be upon him. God, prophets, God promised Muhammad, and he told us whenever we say his name that we should seek peace for him. And we should ask blessings upon him. And, and, and in doing so, we will be blessed. So we always, when we mention the prophet's name, we say, peace and blessings be upon you, or in Arabic, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He also promised Muhammad they will never say my name without saying your name. So every Muslim, when he takes shahada, he says, la ilaha illallah. And then the second part, he says, a Muhammadan for Rasulullah. So he mentions God, and then he mentions Muhammad. So God never breaks his promise. In, in the Quran, which we the Muslims believe is the book of the word of God, in Surah 5, Ayat 82, God says this. And nearest among them in love to the believers will they find those who say we are Christians. Because among these are men and women devoted to learning and men and women who have renounced the world and they are not arrogant. And when they listen to the revelation received by the messenger, thou will see their eyes overflowing with tears. For they pray, our Lord, we believe. Write us down among the witnesses. What cause can we have not to believe in God and the truth which has come to, his, to, to us, seeing that we long for our Lord to admit us to the company of the righteous? And for this their prayer, have God rewarded them with gardens and rivers flowing underneath their eternal home, such as the recompense of those who do good. We pray that God never breaks his promise. We reward all his believing servants with faith who have joined together here today in fellowship with heart's acceptance of one another and grant us all with the peace that we extended earlier and that we give now. Peace and blessings to all of you. Asalaamu Alaikum.